weeks ago, if I can borrow this, if I could talk at a women's luncheon, being non-woman, I haven't been to one of these before. <laughs> and so the topic that I noticed today was keeping cholesterol happy, which really, it's keeping your doctor happy about your cholesterol level is probably more important. Now, my wife asked me today, what are you going to talk about? I said, well, I'll just make up stuff as I go along as I usually do. <laughs> and the main thing about cholesterol is it has gotten a whole lot of press over the past, I would say, 10 to 15 years. And in fact, all these commercials of lowering cholesterol and this drug and that drug and then 5 million side effects of this drug and then your doctor wanting to check it and yelling at you for not exercising and not doing this or that. And, <clears throat> and they patients or when they come to me, they go, well, what does this mean? The, you say my number's not good, what does it mean? Well, in terms of keeping your cholesterol happy, what it means, it has to be individualized. And that's what I try to do when I see a patient. You, for example, may have a different happy level it needs to be based on what other illnesses or medical conditions you have. You, for example, may have an acceptably higher number based on the individual that you are and your risk factors and all this stuff. Now, to keep it happy overall, regardless of risk factors, over the 10 years I've been in practice here and then when I got out of med school like 16 years ago, the numbers keep falling and falling and falling and falling and tumbling about what is, quote, healthy. Nowadays, it is about half of what it used to be 10 years ago. And I don't know if anybody in this room knows what their cholesterol is or talk to their doctor about them, uh, about it, but I would suggest that next time you go, or if you don't have an appointment, make one up, and go talk to your doctor about it and say, you know, there was some doctor at lunch that talked about cholesterol and he talked about risk factors and he talked about medicine and he talked about what number is right for me. What is my number? And what does that mean for me if I don't have that number? Now, what it means basically, if I drew a line right here, all half of you women are going to die of something related to cholesterol, be it a stroke or a heart attack. Half of y'all in this room. Okay, so it's pretty darn serious. And hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol and even high triglycerides is one of the leading causes of stroke or heart attack. So that's why I try to be a, a very big stickler on my patients about what their risk factors are, what their cholesterol is, and what they're doing about it or not doing about it. And when I typically see a patient and we go over their cholesterol, we have a bunch of numbers we look at. And going back to, say, what number yours should be or what number yours should be, we fine-tune that. You know, yours can be maybe 200 total, with a bad one being 100, and yours may be like above 50, with a bad one being below 70 as, as our goal. And then, we have different ways of meeting our goal. The first one, of course, is what your doctor always says, diet and exercise, diet and exercise, diet and exercise. Well, I have a little story about diet. It's actually kind of fun. I had this guy come in a couple of weeks ago. And he's kind of a good old country boy, and he's sat there, and he's got cute. I said, is it half and half bad for you? And I said, well, no, not really. I'll put a little bit in my coffee, you know, in the mornings and stuff like that. He goes, well, what if you drink it? And I said, how much are you drinking? He goes, well, you know those big half-gallon things at Walmart? About two a week. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> and I told the man, I said, you had bypass a year ago, and you're drinking a gallon and a half and half every week. Okay? That is an example to me of the extreme of what not to do. In reality, and, and he's an exceptional patient, I'm mad. In reality, what I, what I like to tell people to do is um, just use common sense. Look at what you're doing, look at what you're eating, look at how you're eating, and you don't have to make drastic changes, just make subtle little changes. You know, for example, have half a gallon to half and half a week instead of a whole gallon as a start. Or go from 2% milk to 
offset milk, or you know, don't get butter, get oleo for those of you who know what that is. And, uh, Got a recipe. and then uh, another kind of popular dietary trend that we have going on is the no white diet, no flour, no sugar, no anything else. But then you have to add what color is fat? White. So that goes with the no white diet, no flour, no sugar, and uh, then no fat. Um, all of y'all have seen the tub of lard, it's all white. Okay. <laughs> Then, the other thing I try to tell the patient to do is exercise, because exercise is another key of controlling all your lipids, and what it does mostly is help to raise the good stuff, the protective stuff. It also lowers the bad stuff or the harmful cholesterol, and then on top of that, if, quote, diet and exercise is not good enough, you may talk to your doctor about Lipitor. So, then, after that, usually doesn't work after three or four months because nobody really wants to change the way they eat and how lazy they are. We have medication. And, of course, medication, when it comes time to that, that's another thing that has to be individualized for the patient. Can they afford it? Will they remember to take it? Do they know they have to take it at night to be most effective versus in the morning? Will it interact with any of the other medicines? Um, what if they have side effects? What do we do about that? And of all the ones that are available, which one do you want to pick? And the, the main lecture I give to my patients or, or information is I give those kind of medicines for two reasons. The first one is not to lower their number. The first reason and the most important reason is the lining of the artery that gets clogged up in a heart attack or a stroke becomes more healthy with that medicine. It makes it less prone to the, for that plaque and stuff to rupture. It makes it more healthy on the inside of the artery, and that's what we like, healthy arteries. And then number two, it does lower the number. So in some people, the goal may not be, oh, we have to have to get you at 70, we have to get you at 100, and maybe we just have to get it on board. And then we worry about the number later. And then, if that works, great. It's tolerated, great. It's affordable, great. They can take it, great. And then we look at how well they go over some time, and then we hopefully can tweak it, or we may have to change it for side effects. Then, <clears throat> we have another issue about cholesterol, is the triglycerides. Now, I'm sure some of your doctors may have told you your triglycerides are too high and need to do something about it. Well, triglycerides, to me, is a nice, big, glazed donut because it's basically a sugary fat. You mix some lard and some powdered sugar together and make a ball, you got a triglyceride. Okay. There's no half and half story to this one. However, some of y'all may have problems also with triglycerides, and the same thing kind of will be applicable to that as it is with cholesterol. Your diet, well, we'll go back to the white thing, no flour, no sugar, no fat and that tries to help. The other one is good diabetic control because if your diabetes is out of control, your triglycerides are out of control. And then medications in addition to ones for cholesterol can also help with triglycerides. And there's also combination medications that are used, either two medicines in one pill or two different pills that will do both. Help your cholesterol and help your triglycerides. Now, so the end result, or my take home message is, number one, you need to know what your number is. Number two, you need to know what your number for you ought to be, because everybody is going to be different. And number three, you need to know what you can do without medicine, and then with medicine, and then if you decide to take medicine, is it going to be the best medicine for you? because half of y'all are going to die from something related to cholesterol, period. I mean, that's, that's it, right? And that, that's basically it. Does anybody have any questions? Hey, before I die.
Okay, good question. How do you determine what number you should have? And what I use is, as I just go strictly for the LDL, the bad cholesterol. Okay. Now, the bad cholesterol, for example, ideally for everybody should be under 100. Now, you get your little printout from your doctor in the lab, and it says, well, it says 130. I'm 125. I'm fine. No, the lab, what they put on the piece of paper is not correct. Your doctor should tell you that that's not correct. Now, if you've got, say, already have had a stroke, You've got some blockage in a carotid artery. You've got some blockage in the leg artery. You've had a stick put in by one of the stick guys or something like that. Or you have a combination of hypertension and diabetes and those kinds of risks. That number should be less than 70. So that's how you have to individualize what number is for you. Now, I had another patient, kind of like the, the half and half drinker, <laughs> whose total cholesterol was 120. His HDL cholesterol was 60, and I gave him a big old fat <laughs> Lipitor kind of medicine to take home after he had his bypass surgery. And, uh, and we were talking, and I said, for your high cholesterol, I want you to take this. And he goes, Dr. Huber, I don't have high cholesterol. I said, yeah, you do, because it's high for you. Despite the numbers, you have heart blockage. Despite the numbers, you need this to reduce your risk further from having new blockage or getting those bypasses clogged up. Okay. So as a rule of thumb, you need to find out, am I in the 100 range or am I below the 70 range? Okay. And your doctor can, or healthcare provider can hopefully individualize that for you and tell you what, where you need to be. Anything? Anybody else? That one question? <laughs> oh, yes. Why do you have to take the like, sandvastine or whatever it is at night? Yeah. Well, okay. why do you have to take the pill at night? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> because of the way your body and your liver kind of recycles fat from the intestine and the bloodstream and the liver, it does most of that work at night when you're asleep not during the daytime. So if you take the pill that changes it, you want to take it at night so it just works better. You know, you can take it in the morning, but it won't work as good. Okay? Because a lot of people forget. I have a lot of patients. Well, I don't remember to take it. Well, I know probably 9 out of 10 of y'all lay in bed at night and watch TV. So I tell people, take their bottle and take it to the remote of your TV oh. clicker, and you're sitting there on turning off the news at 10 30. Oh, I gotta take the pill for <laughs> Really? I'll tell them, take it to the clicker on the on the back of the TV. And they remember. That's a good idea. Any other questions? At what age should you get it checked? Well, I'll put it to you this way. I have a lady that I had to send to Houston three years ago to get a four-vessel bypass surgery. She was 38. Okay. So, and she obviously had more than just heart disease wrong with her. However, um, you can never really be too young. And let me tell you why. A lot of y'all may or may not know there's a huge artery that comes out of your heart and runs in front of your spine called the aorta. Before you're born, it's got fat in it already. Before you're born. And it just accumulates over time and as you age. So you really cannot test it too young, so to speak. And if you're interested in, in getting your number tested just to know, you can go across the street to Express Lab for like, what, 30 bucks and have it done. You can go to a health fair at the mall or whatever. Both hospitals put on health fairs. They can prick your finger and check it and things like that. Um, you, you can't really be too young to check it. But keep in mind, it starts before you're born. You know, your aorta has a big streak of fat in it before you're born already. So you can kind of blame your parents a little bit for it, I guess. So you have any of these.
Anybody else? They probably had some in there too. Okay. If you can't tolerate the statin drugs, now there's there's two types of can't take them. Okay. One type of can't take them is you can't take this brand. We'll pick on Lipitor. I can't take Lipitor, it makes my legs hurt, or my back hurt, or whatever. Okay. Well, maybe it's just that particular brand. Let's try this brand over here, like a Crestor. And for a lot of people, that's fine. They, they can't take that one brand. For a lot of other people, it's the whole class of statin drugs. You can't take any of them. However, for a lot of my patients, going back to the health of the inside of the artery first, I tell them to try a little tiny dose, maybe a fourth of one three days a week. At least we got it on board to help the artery remain clean or prevent it from getting more clogged up. Then we'll worry about the number later. For some patients that absolutely cannot take them, period, we have to look at the alternatives. Okay. The only real alternative the American Heart Association recommends is a supplement called red rice yeast. And, and that does some for helping the artery stay clean, and, but it's not going to do much on the number of the cholesterol. There's another pill that used to be used for gallstones a long, long time ago that's been reformulated, and you can take it to lower the cholesterol. You have to take six pills a day of that. So that's kind of inconvenient. And it unfortunately will raise the triglyceride number a little bit, but lower the cholesterol some. And um, makes it constipated, and most people don't take it. You know, when I tell them, here's six pills, no, that's a no problem. You know, but then you go back to the first, foremost treatment of diet and exercise. And then if you have to do a step, and then trying it at a lower dose, three days a week, Cutting it in a fourth. Okay. Something like that. But I'll go through, there's some people I've gone through four different pills for, we found one that they can take. But then they can only take it three days a week. You know. Anyone else? What's your opinion of the generic comes It's four bucks at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> or ten bucks for 90 days. Okay. Um, when you look at all the different statin drugs, they compare each other by potency in their milligram potency. Okay, there's uh, Crestor, for example, is the, the most potent one per milligram, and it really doesn't matter which one you get. You want to take the minimum that'll reach the goal number. And I don't care, I have a lot of people go get the simvastatin at Walmart. In fact, I've got some patients, I'll give a big one to, they cut it in half, and the husband takes one, the wife takes the other. <laughs> you know. So there's, there's no real difference to me in generic statin drugs, per se. You know. But if you say if you were taking a, a 10 milligram Crestor, you'd probably have to do a 40 or an 80 simvastatin from Walmart to get the same number. You know, that's how different they are. What was the question? Uh, the generic simvastatin drug versus like a name brand Zocor. You know. Somebody in the back, back here? On Zetia? With what else? You're doing something else. I've, in, in, in Zetia is a type of medicine that is um, designed to help lower triglycerides. And it also works with the statin attached to it, like simvastatin, to help lower the cholesterol as well. Okay, the name brand of that combination drug is called Vitorin, I've used a bunch of it, and it does very well at lowering cholesterol, and but some people that can't take a statin may, well, their doctor put them on Zetia. In my experience, despite what the Zetia drug reps